Call the committee to order. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Thank you for your patience with us. Um, I'm going to start with laying a little groundwork uh, over some questions that were posed yesterday regarding the committee's, uh, how we addressed certain things with the respondent and, and some allegations that were made as far as evidence. So House Rule 45, which we all as members of the House have adopted, um, states that the accused, or I shall say the respondent, shall have a full and fair opportunity to obtain and review all evidence in support of the complaint. It does not put the burden of sharing that evidence on the committee, but when asked, the committee needs to respond and provide it. Um, there were multiple opportunities to obtain all evidence and support prior to the hearing. Specifically, the committee adopted rules for the hearing as authorized by rule, House Rule 45. The hearing rules state that the respondent could obtain all of the evidence by simply asking for it, which is hearing rule nine. The committee needed to ask the respondent for all evidence she planned to present by the same deadline, which was hearing rule 10. The committee asked for evidence before the deadline. We did not receive a, a request for any evidence before or after that deadline. The committee repeatedly sent the hearing rules to the respondent prior to the hearing, two emails, on July 21st, 11 days before the hearing, and again on July 27th, specifically reminding the respondent that she had rights under Rule 9 to ask for the evidence. All evidence used in the hearing was either widely available public documents, information previously, set, previously sent to the respondent and in her possession, or her own words. Uh, any claim that we did not share evidence with her is, is moot at that point because of these matters here in doing that. So in going forward at this point, I would open up this uh, hearing to committee discussion. Uh, Representative Gannon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, this is, uh, there's nothing easy about this case and there's nothing easy about a decision like this, um, especially when, when you've, uh, when you know the individuals involved and uh, have had, I would say, I would say a pleasant working relationship with them, even though, even though many times they do not, um, it, it, we, we do not end up agreeing. Um, but in the end, I have to look at the evidence and the law and the rules in this case and set aside um, some uh, frustr uh, personalities, maybe frustrations some people have had on one side or the other. And for me, this is a basic personnel matter. Uh, whether Jane Doe is an intern or a volunteer, uh, what rights do people in that situation have when they file a whistleblower complaint with the Idaho legislature? And what are, what are the obligations of a legislator, since legislators are essentially administrators of the House of Representatives who elect one person to manage day-to-day -day activities? The issue, in summary here, is that is the rights of an employee intern to make a claim of violation of law and improper conduct, and whether the response by a person in power, in this case a legislator, is or is not conduct unbecoming a member of the legislator, legislature. And this involves a consideration of Idaho law, uh, Mason's Rule 4.2, as well as the evidence presented at our hearing. First, I note, there is no rape shield law in Idaho. So uh, other states have enacted them, but Idaho has not. So we cannot look to that for guidance. There is, however, a Idaho whistleblower statute, which provides protection for public employees who report to administrators any quote, suspected state law violations. And in section three of the statute, it does pro prohibit adverse action against an employee. Whether, whether the uh, Jane Doe is an employee is not clear. She was, uh, many have called her an intern and uh, uh, Representative Giddings believes she was a volunteer 
but certainly, and so they may not be specifically within the statute, but certainly the statute gives us some guidance of, regarding the public policy of the state of Idaho with regard to uh, sexual harassment complaints which are uh, presented to administrators by public employees. Second statute that may have, um, may, may be helpful is uh, Idaho Code 67 which provides for reprisals for opposing unlawful practices. Um, it does appear to apply to the human rights uh, chapter, but, um, and, and so it may not be specifically applicable to the legislature. But again, it gives us some guidance on what uh, the public policy overall is in the state of Idaho. Now, when there isn't a particular rule or law that is applicable, um, we look to Mason's 4.2. And under Mason's 4.2, we look to custom, usage, and precedence in determining the standard of conduct. Um, and I do have copies of that if anybody would like one. Um, let's first talk about the custom, and that's, that's why I was asking questions of the witnesses about the custom in, in, um, in public employment and even uh, in private employment. The custom, um, we had testimony from uh, a representative who had spent 30 years in teaching and uh, education administration testify about the practices at the school districts in which she was involved. We had a uh, former businessman, Representative uh, Vanderwoudy, who testified regarding uh, business and uh, in general in the community. And he said that in general in the public, uh, uh, he, he gave his opinion on what uh, the public generally would find acceptable um, uh, in, under these circumstances. Um, Representative Cheney testified uh, regarding uh, his experience in public uh, law enforcement employment. Um, Representative Green testified how the Ada County Highway District would handle uh, a, uh, a situation such as we're faced with. And uh, so did, and uh, Representative Mathias testified how uh, the State Board of Education and other public agencies in Idaho that he has worked with, I believe it was Boise State, uh, would, would handle the matter. Um, in in all, case, all the evidence, I mean, that's the evidence that I have to look at. All the evidence was that you don't disclose the name of, uh, of, of a, a person who has filed a complaint, a whistleblower type complaint, which is essentially what this is. Um, you don't put their picture on social media. You, you don't do that if you're involved in the organization. Uh, so, um, you know, I don't, I, I don't see where uh, I really have a choice but to find that what was done was wrong because I don't have any evidence to the contrary. I didn't have anybody come into, the, into this hearing and say, well, you know, in, in my business, um, this is something that uh, we do when we have a whistleblower uh, type complaint. Uh, we, uh, one of the administrators will publish the, will publish the name, um, or in this case, publish the picture and an article about it and that kind of thing. I didn't have, there's no evidence. Now, if there is some, it should have been brought. And there were uh, a number of witnesses listed, but then they never, and many of whom were in the room, but then they never testified. So without that kind of evidence, what conclusion can one come to except that, well, uh, this, uh, doing this is not appropriate for a person in authority uh, uh, to, uh, under these circumstances. Um, we can also look at precedent, and again, 
The president uh, is that uh, there was an incident in the Senate several years ago, well publicized, where a, um, uh, a Senate staffer was sexually harassed, the senator resigned, and even today, uh, 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 Representative uh, Vanderwaddy testified he doesn't know who she was. Um, his daughter serves in the Senate, and the name was never even given given out in uh, uh, private, you know, in private conversations, that kind of thing, as far as I know. And I, and that's the evidence I have to have because there's no evidence to the contrary, none. There's no evidence that ever in the Idaho legislature has a person who filed a sexual harassment claim had uh, been publicly uh, exposed uh, in one way or another, publicly disclosed, disclosed in one way or another. There's just no evidence of that. And so what, what can you do as a finder of fact, as a committee, but find that the precedent in the Idaho legislature is you don't do it. You don't, uh, there's just nothing, there's no evidence and um, uh, to the contrary. Now why should we care? I think this is, this is an issue that, um, that uh, needs to be addressed. And I think that the reason behind whistleblower statute, the, the reason behind disclosure is that we want people to come forward and make complaints. Um, we want people to um, um, uh, make good faith complaints, but we want them to feel like they're not gonna be punished if they disclose, for example, somebody is embezzling money. Um, we uh, or suspected of embezzling money, or somebody is uh, improperly using state property, these kinds of things, um, or sexual harassment. We want to make sure that people are not deterred from doing that, and that's why you have um, the whistleblower law, that's why you have this law in the Human Rights Act, and that's why uh, the custom and practice at the legislature appears to be, and there's no evidence to the contrary, none that was presented to us. It appears that, uh, that you don't disclose the name of the complaining party. Um, there's another reason, and that's also legal liability. Um, if um, administrators uh, start uh, getting involved it, it publicly, uh, things can be said and suddenly the state has more legal liability. Um, the actions of state officials uh, can result in lawsuits and uh, can result in legal actions. And so that's another reason why um, um, I think you have the, uh, the whistleblower law as well as uh, the protection of those who um, um, uh, protection of those who make complaints. Now, um, in, in looking at the, um, um, okay, so what's the consequence of this? And there's several things to look at. Um, again, I don't have a lot of evidence, which is um, too bad, because I really would have liked to have heard from a couple of the witnesses, um, particularly uh, David Leroy, who was listed as a witness, uh, but uh, by uh, Representative Giddings. But um, first is how long did it stay on the on the Facebook, and it stayed on for I'm not clear as to how long actually, um, but it was eventually removed. The fi the picture was removed. Um, uh, second, um, there's the, um, um, you know, why it was put up there in the first place, which wasn't clear, well, w wasn't clear to me. Some of the, some of the, uh, the, the, the timeline wasn't clear to me, um, but at any rate, it didn't appear, it doesn't appear like this is the kind of, um, 
um, ac actions or that would result in uh, a very uh, in a severe penalty because of the um, of the of the of some of the mitigation, but certainly um, the fact that twenty four legislators filed a complaint and uh, that uh, that they felt there was uh, a need to do something as well as the um, the evidence, which was just overwhelming, that what was done was improper. Um, it 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 requires that we take some very strong action, and I'll I'll leave it to uh, I think the chairman will announce what that action is. Thank you, Representative Gannon. Representative Horman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to open by saying I will be recommending that we dismiss the April 19th complaint or the Cheney complaint. Uh, we are not the appropriate body to evaluate criminality, and I do believe that all of the allegations uh, stated in that complaint are fully covered in uh, the group complaint. So uh, regarding the May thir uh, third group complaint, though, it, it expressed two primary concerns. Um, of 24 members. They signed it because they believe the actions constituted conduct unbecoming, which is detrimental to the integrity of the House. Their first point was that Representative Giddings, quote, disseminated the identity and photo of a young lady who reported a sexual assault. The second point was that Representative Giddings misrepresented her actions to the Ethics Committee while under oath during former Von Ellinger's ethics hearing. Point one, uh, posting the name and photo of an alleged sexual assault victim. Uh, I believe Representative Giddings does have a free speech right to do that. Um, as she asserted in her uh, very thorough, detailed response to the committee. I agree that she has the right uh, to publish the name and photo of an alleged assault victim. Um, that matter is not in question for me. What is in question for me is her judgment and intent in doing so. But as was stated yesterday, just because we can do something doesn't mean we should. And it still means that the whole truth should be told, even if there might be consequences. And Rep Representative Giddings admits as much in her written response to the committee, where she quoted a 1944 Supreme Court case, Baumgartner versus the US, that says, quote, one of the prerogatives of American citizenship is the right to criticize public men and measures. And that means not only informed and responsible criticism, but the freedom to speak foolishly and without moderation. However, the Idaho Constitution says it even better long before 1944, Article 1, Section 9 states, quote, every person may freely speak, write, and publish on all subjects, being responsible for the abuse of that liberty. In my humble opinion, that modern interpretation of write and publish includes typing on your Android phone. I've been able to identify a single other legislator who made the decision that she did to publish the alleged victim's identity. That doesn't mean it didn't happen. It just means I've been able to find anyone else who made that decision and that choice. So while Representative Giddings claims to take a backseat to no one in protecting victims' rights, it appears instead that she was indeed not in the backseat, but in fact in the driver's seat and the only legislator to expose, not protect, the identity of an alleged victim. And I will be happy to stand corrected if someone can point out to me that in fact she did have a co-pilot in that behavior. Part two of the group complaint uh, is regarding misrepresentations and the appearance of dishonesty while under oath. 
Witnesses yesterday testified under oath that they believe she did not tell the whole truth under oath, that she was less than forthcoming. She was elusive and evasive in her responses um, in the previous hearing, so I don't believe any further comment from me on that issue is necessary. What does concern me is that I saw that pattern repeated yesterday with the addition yesterday of false statements, such as, quote, the entire Democratic caucus, unquote, signed the second complaint. That is demonstrably false, even though she was not under oath when she said it. She also stated yesterday that she had skimmed the readout news article before she posted it, but that she had not read it thoroughly. So I'm struggling to reconcile that statement uh, with her testimony previously to this committee under oath that the article would fulfill her desire to accurately represent both sides of the story. I'm frankly uncertain how she would know that uh, would how she would know that if she had not thoroughly read the article. There's an irony of not wanting to waste taxpayer money, but requesting that the committee's counsel um, prepare subpoenas that were never served. If her intent was to simply email her colleagues and those that she had requested to testify, um, we could have saved a whole lot of taxpayer money by not having uh, expensive attorneys prepare those subpoenas um, for most of the day Friday. It's troubling to me that she is fundraising as a result of this hearing to pay for legal counsel that she doesn't appear to have. And she explicitly stated yesterday, quote, that she, uh, quote, was representing herself to the best of her ability. I'm concerned about claims that she made yesterday about no protection from uh, public opinion, trial by public opinion, when so many statements were made on social media, on the radio, on, um, in other media interviews, where she herself was trying this in the court of public opinion, but then declined to fully participate in, in the preliminary investigation and in fact chose not to even be present for the morning portion of, um, part of the morning portion of the hearing. Those are all her rights to do, yet it makes her express desire to, that this not be tried in the court of public opinion seem disingenuous. She has also stated that the, quote, ethics committee accusations that I acted in retaliation, and I would like to remind everyone that the ethics committee has made exactly zero allegations, spurious or otherwise, of retaliation or of whistleblowing. Those were made by two dozen House members, uh, as specified in the complaint. Again, a demonstrably false statement. The accusations were not brought by the House Ethics Committee. They were brought by 24 of her colleagues. Was concerned about the lack of civility and respect yesterday, a basic sense of decency toward other House members, toward our process, from the infamous now deleted Facebook post to asking the committee's lawyers where he went to law school. Duke, by the way. Um, He was asking a very straightforward question if she stood by the accuracy of her prior statements. The lack of regard for her colleagues who took the time to come here yesterday to explain why they signed the ethics complaint and then claiming it to be a political stunt because she's a candidate for a statewide office when she definitely was not a candidate for statewide office at the time of the filing of the complaints. This pattern of lack of respect for the dignity of other human beings, our standards, many of us would say, are below any citizen, including a member of the House of Representatives. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the, the uh, phrase that stands out to me this morning is not even conduct unbecoming. I believe that's been proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, 
it is uh, now detrimental to the integrity of the House. And in my opinion, her behaviors yesterday were detrimental. Um, and uh, Mr. Chairman, I believe those examples uh, that I have described are sufficient at this point in the hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Foreman. Representative McCrosty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and fellow committee members. I can honestly say that in my seven years here in the legislature, I never expected to be part of this committee during an ethics hearing, let alone two within a matter of months. The question that we have before us today, like what we went through in April, is whether Representative Giddings engaged in conduct unbecoming a representative which is detrimental to the integrity of the House as a legislative body. Today, like then, the facts are indisputable. Representative Giddings posted a link on her Facebook page to a website and disseminated the name, photo, and identity of Jane Doe, a sexual assault survivor. Giddings posted the same link in her newsletter using the state-provided gov delivery system. Now here's where things get challenging. Does the respondent have a right to post whatever she wants to uh, to her social media accounts? Sure. Was what she posted tacky or inappropriate? Sure. Was it harmful to Jane Doe, a sexual, a sexual assault survivor? Yes. And did the trolls finally get her to take her post down? Yes. But while distasteful, this part of both complaints, the actual posting of distasteful information that further victimizes a sexual assault survivor in a state that lacks a rape shield law is protected speech that this committee cannot currently stifle. Yet as discussed, yet as discussed yesterday, just because it can be said doesn't mean that it's prudent to say, and it doesn't mean there aren't consequences. What also needs to be determined concerns the respondent's conduct during the prior ethics hearing. She testified in support of the former representative and was not compelled by this committee to appear. She appeared on her own accord and voluntarily swore, swore an oath to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yet we heard from five of the 24 co-signers on the second complaint state that they found the respondent's testimony that day to be some form of half-truth, less than truth, or not the whole truth. Part of what we also heard was this, just own it. Admit what took place, apologize, and then we can find a place of forgiveness. We, as a committee, needed to obtain information to determine if there was probable cause to move either of these complaints forward. If she had owned her actions and apologized, it's entirely conceivable that the complaints could have been dismissed, but the respondent failed to make herself available to this committee to clarify or even clear up the situation. Her lack of participation in the investigatory phase forced this committee's hand to move forward with this public hearing. So today, we must determine if the respondent's conduct from the prior hearing constitutes conduct unbecoming during this hearing. Based on yesterday, the prior hearing was not an outlier, but part of a pattern. The half-truths, misinformation, and incomplete facts given by the respondent, both yesterday and during the prior hearing, harms the integrity of the House as a legislative body, as well as this ethics committee, whoever comprises its memberships now or in the future. To ignore the respondent's conduct is impossible without simultaneously harming the House as an institution. Therefore, committee, I find the respondent's conduct to be unbecoming. Thank you, Representative McCrosty. Representative Crane. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The assignment given to us by our peers by selecting us to sit on the Ethics Committee is a very difficult assignment. Having to sit in the seat of judgment of a fellow colleague is weighty, and it's one I do not take lightly. Having said that, our peers look to us to help guide how we should conduct ourselves as legislators, and that is why the Ethics Committee exists. The citizens of Idaho look to us as leaders to set the standard of what behavior is acceptable 
or unacceptable. 25 of your colleagues put forward a complaint that they believe your conduct in the Aaron Van Ollinger trial was unbecoming, detrimental to the integrity of the House. They expressed concern that your behavior in doxing a 19-year-old volunteer was unacceptable. As elected officials, we oftentimes say things that we later regret. I have found myself saying things sometimes that I later regretted and had to ask for forgiveness. We are human. We make mistakes. However, I have found if I will humble myself and ask for forgiveness, most often, most people are more than willing to forgive. I wish, Representative Giddings, you would have taken this approach. I agree wholeheartedly with you. You have a First Amendment right to say what you said. And I tried to bring that out in the hearing yesterday. I have also learned in 15 years as a legislator, just because I have a right to say something does not mean I should say it. I understand your desire to get the Aaron Von Ellinger response to the charges or the complaint out, but I think you should have released his response that he made to the committee, not this news source story. Was the House reputation damaged by you releasing the story? Maybe. But the real damage, which to the integrity of the House, was how you responded. Under oath, when asked about releasing the photo, the posting of it, the administration of your Facebook account in the Aaron Von Ellinger hearing, hearing, you were not forthright. On the 20th of July, you went on the radio with Nate Shellman, and you made statements such as the following. The reason behind this ethics complaint is because I'm running for lieutenant governor. Yet, you hadn't even announced you were running for lieutenant governor when the complaint was filed on May 3rd. I didn't know she was running for governor when the complaint was filed. You said also in that interview, if you look at the names, this is a direct quote, if you look at the names, I mean 12 of them are Democrats and the others are very progressive Republicans. Yet, if you look at the names, eight of them are Democrats, seven of them, or 17 of them are Republicans, and I would hardly call John Vanderwada or Julie Yamamoto a progressive, a very progressive Republican. But that's my opinion. You also said due process was not allowed throughout this entire process. That is not true. That is false. You said the committee was working outside the bounds of law and order. Not true. That is false. I watched a video interview of you. Again, you doubled down and you said they are operating outside the law. That is not true. We are operating under House Rule 45 and have been very diligent in following House Rule 45. You said in that video interview, the committee is being selective by not investigating a legislator caught in a high school bathroom. That legislator is a senator. This committee has absolutely no jurisdiction over that senator's behavior. That's a Senate matter. This is the House Ethics and, Public, House Ethics and Policy Committee. We don't have any jurisdiction over the Senate. You know that, or at least you should know that. You said in that interview, the Ethics Committee did not release the counter complaint in the Aaron Von Ellinger hearing, as well as in your hearing. Yet, when I pressed you yesterday with House Rule 45, you could not prove that we have to, because House Rule 45 very explicitly states you only release the complaint, not the response to that complaint. But again, that's the narrative that you are purporting out there. You also said in the video interview, the Ethics Committee is selectively deciding who they will go after. That's patently false. We have to take up every single ethics complaint that comes before this committee. We don't get to select. We don't get to choose. Um, it's, it, that's what's difficult about this assignment. You went on to say in that video interview, quote, usually the chairman of the ethics committee is working hand in hand with the speaker to determine which complaints to go forward with. Patently false. It's an outright lie. When a complaint is filed, the chairman brings the complaint to the committee. That's how it works. The first phase of that is private. Sometimes those complaints are dismissed. We know nothing about them. Other times they're reprimanded inside that 
private process. That's where 95 to 98 percent of these complaints get handled. But they, but the chairman has an obligation to bring those to the committee, and he has every single time. So you can go ahead and purport that narrative, but it is a bald-faced lie. The committee tried to get me to go to a meeting outside of House Rule 45. Again, another lie. It's not true. We asked you, and I went over the litany of the times we asked you to come to a preliminary investigation, which is what is provided for in House Rule 45. We contacted you eight, eight times. We started on June 3rd, an email requesting an interview to discuss the complaints. No response from Representative Giddings. June 21st, a letter was served to Representative Giddings. Again, no response. July 19th, a notice of probable cause and a public hearing was served. July 19th, an email notice of probable cause and public hearing. July 20th, email notice of probable cause and public hearing. July 21st, issued a subpoena. July 21st, two more emails went out. July 27th, an email reminding Giddings of her opportunities to obtain committee evidence and attaching rules of procedure. And again, the 27th, we sent her another email providing the names of the committee witnesses, requesting the names of her, her witnesses, evidence and if she plans to present, all to come and talk to us on the 28th. And yet you refused. That's your decision. But don't try to tell the citizens of the state of Idaho that we operated outside of House Rule 45. That is a bald-faced lie. Public hearing. I'll never forget sitting here yesterday in the afternoon when you finally did appear before the committee. The first thing you said to the chairman after you guys decided to move the press over, which I was in favor of and the chairman accommodated you, was can you explain why I was not given copies of the evidence? It's not true. You were given copies of the evidence. Here's emails offering to give you copies of the evidence. Again, don't turn this into a trial where poor me, they violated a rule. It's not true. Representative Giddings, you were combative. You still refused to directly answer the questions that the committee had for you. I had to admonish you to just answer the question, to not hedge, not play semantics, not play games. You don't know this, Representative, but we spent over an hour on Friday. I was in the mountains with my family on Friday. I had to leave the event that I was at to not take one, but two calls Me too. to deal with the issue of your witnesses that we received five minutes before the deadline of 8 a.m. on Friday morning. We spent over an hour going through your witnesses, some of them relevant to your defense, some of them completely irrelevant. But the point that this committee arrived at after lots of discussion was that we wanted to give you every single witness on your witness list so that you could mount a defense and you could explain your, your position. There were individuals in the room yesterday at the hearing and you didn't call a single one of them. Representative Giddings, you're entitled to your own narrative, but you're not entitled to make up your own facts. I entered the hearing yesterday hoping that you would just answer the committee questions and we can get these complaints behind us, but that did not happen. I was very disappointed in your behavior before the committee in the Aaron Von Ellinger hearing and again in yesterday's hearing. Your failure to listen to your colleagues talk about why they filed the complaint and what could have been done to resolve the complaint was stunning to me. Not even showing the respect to your fellow colleagues to show up and hear what they have to say. It's problematic. I hope this will serve as a learning opportunity for you. Candidly, it pains me to have to punish you. But current and future legislators will look to the actions of this committee, and I hope our action will serve as a guiding light as to what conduct is expected of legislators.
When a legislator repeatedly tells half-truths, outright lies, fails to answer questions, or to be honest with the committee, this type of hate behavior will not be tolerated. The Ethics Committee expects better conduct of its members of the House of Representatives and the citizens of Idaho deserve better conduct from their legislators. Thank you, Representative Crane. Um, I'll be brief as I normally am here. Most of what has been running through my mind has been stated by my colleagues up here. Um, I think we heard strong testimony from five of the folks who signed the complaints yesterday expressing their concern with the behavior and why they felt it was detrimental to the House and conduct unbecoming in that sense. We heard that uh, it's not just conduct unbecoming of a legislator, but of everybody. We should expect more from each one of ourselves, not just us as legislators being in the public eye. What if we all behaved this way in doing that? Um, the legitimacy that is given to certain statements when you wear this black tag, when you use government uh, uh, forms of communication, there, there is a, a sense of it that it has to be truth. Uh, this person is elected to represent us, to, to fight on our behalf, if you will, and therefore they would not be leading me astray in any way in that sense. Um, we're accountable for what we say, regardless of the First Amendment. You have the right to say these things, but there's also an accountability that goes along with that. Own what you did. I think that was the most strong testimony that I heard yesterday. If there was some contrition, if there was a bit of, of remorse or repentance on the, on the behalf of, of what had happened, all would be forgiven. And I think everybody on this dais feels that way, let alone most in our body. We are a very forgiving group. We have uh, dealt with some other issues uh, amongst ourselves, but when people take accountability for those actions, we, we move forward in that sense. And uh, that was very strong, what Representative Yamamoto said. I think that moved most of us up here. And that we should not be responsible for the mistrust in government or perpetuating that. There will naturally be a mistrust of government, and there should be from the citizens to keep it in check. But we should not be responsible for perpetuating that by misleading the public in doing that. Our role up here is to determine whether a member's conduct is detrimental to the House of Representatives as a whole. Equally as important is the trust between members. Can we trust statements made in committee? from the dais or from in presenting legislation? Can we trust statements made on the floor? In being less than truthful during a public hearing while under oath, abridges the trust of both the public and fellow members of the House of Representatives and can justly be construed as conduct unbecoming and detrimental to the House of Representatives. Our role is to protect the body. We've been elected by our peers to do that. It's not something anybody sought out in this, and, uh, but it's something we have been volunteered for by our, our peers, and, and we take that role very seriously, as you've heard from each one of us here. Um, there's a similar role within the church, and there's discipline that comes from the church, and that is not only to protect the body, but it's also to affect restoration of that member who comes under discipline from the church. And that's a majority of our goal here as well, uh, of letting a member know they've stepped outside the parameters of what the body feels is appropriate for the body and how it reflects itself to the public. So the hope is, as we move towards a decision here as a body, that that, that will also play upon the respondent's mind, that there will be some sense of uh, repentance and contrition that can then help that restoration come in. So not just a protection of the body, but also to help a, a change for the positive and positive for government as higher ambitions uh, are sought in that sense and moving forward, that we will reflect more of truth and, and less of um, something that, that pales in front of truth in doing that. So committee, I'm open for a motion. Representative Horman. Mr. Chairman, I move to dismiss the complaint dated April 19th, the Cheney complaint, because the allegations contained are uh, in that complaint are fully addressed by the complaint brought later by 24 members of the Idaho House of Representatives. Thank you, Representative Horman. Our motion is to dismiss the Cheney complaint. Is there any discussion on that motion? Representative Crane, no? Okay. All right, all in favor of dismissing the Cheney complaint, say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion passes. Thank you, Representative Foreman. 
Representative Horman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move that the committee finds by clear and convincing evidence that Representative Giddings has conducted herself in a manner unbecoming a representative, which is detrimental to the integrity of the House as a legislative body, and that the committee recommends to the full House of Representatives that Representative Giddings be censured with the condition that she be removed from her seat on the House Commerce and Human Resources Committee. Thank you, Representative Horman. Committee, our motion is that we find Representative Giddings having engaged in conduct unbecoming and that is detrimental to the House of Representatives as a body and that we recommend censure with removal from the House Commerce and Human Resources Committee to the full body. Is there any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion passes as well. Committee, is there any further discussion? then we are adjourned. Thank you very much.